Hi, welcome back. What we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at an alternative function of the G protein. And this, the, and this, this function actually, instead of activating adenylate cyclase, we're going to activate a different enzyme, as we'll see. And I have a molecule drawn here. And this is, this is called PIP2. It's, and again, it's all, it can also be called, it can also be called, um, it, 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 it is PIP2, but that stands for phosphatidyl, and it's phosphatidyl because it is a phospholipid, phosphatidyl inositol, phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bis um, phosphate, okay? And what we'll find is that PIP2 actually plays a central role in this pathway for ultimately increasing the intracellular concentration of calcium ions. Okay, that's a lot of words, and let's actually look at the mechanism. So here, here is, you know, I'll go ahead and draw it. Here's the, here's, you know, some receptor, right? We used the adrenergic receptor in the last one, right? But it really, it can be any, it can be any hormone, right? Any hormone receptor. So here's, here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So it's going to be a hormone. It's going to bind to the receptor, right? And you're going to have the whole other physiology, right? But instead of binding to adenylate cyclase, the G protein, which remember, I'll just draw the alpha subunit for now, but the G protein is going to dissociate and it's going to activate a different enzyme. It's going to activate a different enzyme. Okay, so I'll go ahead and draw the G protein over here and it's the alpha subunit, right? And of course it has to have bound GTP, right? So let me, let me indicate that. It has bound GTP, right? And the enzyme in this case and so, by the way, it's not just like we're doing random examples. This is actually a very common uh, physiological component in the cell. But in this case, the alpha subunit is going to activate an enzyme called phospho phospholipase C. Okay, this is phospholipase C. And this, this is a very, very important enzyme. And what it's going to do is it's going to increase the concentration. It's going to increase the concentration of intracellular IP3. And what does that mean? Well, essentially what's going to happen is phospholipase C is a serine lipase, right? Or a serine hydrolase. But ultimately the net effect, and again, this is not the mechanism. By the way, I want to illustrate this is not the mechanism. If you want to learn the mechanism, just um, go in and look at a serine lipase or a serine hydrolase mechanism. But ultimately, and again, I can't, I can't emphasize this enough. This is not the mechanism, but the net effect is essentially the loss is the loss of diacyl glycerol. So in, what ends up happening with this enzyme is you put in PIP2, right? And you end up getting two products. One of them is diacyl glycerol. We'll actually go into the function of that a little bit later. But the other one that we're going to look at right now is IP3, is IP3. And I'll go ahead and draw the structure of IP3 right now. And inositols are not synthesized in humans, but the inositol ultimately comes from, it comes from glucose 6-phosphate. And you can sort of, I mean, not really, but you can sort of see, you can sort of see the, the six-membered ring, but what you would find is that ultimately it comes from glucose 6-phosphate. Okay, and then this one goes down. And this right here is IP3. And IP3 has specific receptors on the endoplasmic reticulum. So, here, so here's my plasma membrane, right? There's my plasma membrane. And if I go deeper into the cell, right, I have an endoplasmic reticulum, right? So here's the membrane of my endoplasmic reticulum, and there are receptors on it. And specifically, they are um, ionotropic receptors. And if you want to learn about ionotropics, we might do a video on that someday. But they're ionotropic receptors, and the IP3 specifically binds to the receptors. Now, what you have to realize is inside the ER, the rough ER, there's lots of calcium ions. And so when IP3 binds to its ionotropic receptor, the calcium, the channels open and calcium floods into the, intra, into the intracellular space or into the cytoplasm. So what the net effect of IP3 is, is a, a sharp rise in the intracellular calcium ion concentration. Is the rise in calcium ion concentration, okay? And calcium has specific functions and it, 
in general, it's a, it's a second messenger. And in the initial video, we talked about second messengers and how they are really the ones that carry out the function inside the cell. But let, let's right now talk about how calcium is a second messenger. Well, first thing I want to do is I want to, I want to talk about a protein. And this protein has, it doesn't look exactly like this, but you could sort of think of it like this conceptually. Okay, so I have a protein here called calmodulin. So this one right here is calmodulin, right? And calmodulin is bound to another protein, do an orange. Calmodulin is bound to another protein. This protein is called calmodulin-dependent protein kinase, okay? Now, normally, calmodulin is sort of acting as a regulatory protein, okay? It's inhibiting the activity of, of calmodulin-dependent protein kinase. So the ultimate sort of, you could think of downstream, you know, phosphorylations that lead to the cellular response are carried out by calmodulin-dependent protein kinase. But calmodulin sort of holds on to that enzyme and inhibits it. But what ends up happening is the calcium that's released by the endoplasmic reticulin ends up binding to the calmodulin. So calmodulin is a calcium binding protein. And when it binds calcium, it undergoes a massive change in conformation and it releases it releases, so releases, here's calmodulin, it releases the calmodulin-dependent protein kinase, right? So here's the calmodulin-dependent protein kinase. And then this particular enzyme goes and carries out the cellular response. So I'll just, again, there's lots of things that can phosphorylate, so I'll just put, in general, cellular response. And so what does this mean? Well, calmodulin binds calcium, and normally it's sort of holding the protein kinase in a vice grip. Right? It's not letting the kinase exert its effect. But when calcium ion rises in the cell, um, in the cytoplasm, it binds to calmodulin, and calmodulin sort of lets go, and when it changes conformation, and, it, and cal calmodulin-dependent protein kinase dissociates and carries out its, the phosphorylation response. And, and of course, the, the, res the response is really just due to activation of enzymes by phosphorylation. Okay, so what caused that? Well, it was the rise in intracellular IP3, and that's, of course, inositol 145 trisphosphate. So that's what it stands for, inositol 145 trisphosphate. Okay, so generally that's the response to IP3, but there's also diacylglycerol, right? There's also diacylglycerol. Now, to illustrate this, what I want to do is I want to sort of, let me actually build another membrane over here. Let me build another membrane. Um, so here's a membrane. And there's another enzyme in the membrane. Let me do it in blue. And this enzyme is sort of situated on the intracellular side. And this enzyme is called protein kinase C, right? And so you can imagine that when, so we had PIP2 in here, right? There's PIP2. And you can imagine when, imagine that when protein, or excuse me, when, when phospholipase C um, hydrolyzed it, Again, you have IP3 that sort of leaves and it, you know, it goes and does its response that we just talked about, but there's a diacylglycerol that's sort of situated in the membrane. So that red dot, that's diacylglycerol, and essentially that's just the, the rest of this over here, right? If I was to circle the diacylglycerol, it would be all this business. This is essentially the diacylglycerol that's your leaving group whenever phospholipase C does its action, right? And you can imagine that the diacylglycerol, you, you saw, if we go back over here, right? It's fairly hydrophobic, right? It's fairly hydrophobic. It's got these long carbon chains. And so it can move along the membrane, right? It can move along the membrane because it's hydrophobic. So the diacylglycerol is going to sort of move over here, and it's going to bind to protein kinase C and activate it. And of course, like all these systems, protein kinase C can activate a large number of um, proteins and things like that. So we're just going to put, in general, that it activates a cellular response. And of course, the cellular response is done by activation of other enzymes by phosphorylation, right? And so like we talked about in the last video, which was the termination of the response, right? You can imagine that to terminate these responses, you would have corresponding phosphatases, right? So the phosphatases, phosphatases would be hydrolases, and the hydrolases would terminate the activity. See you in the next video.